In this video, I'm going to show you how you can photograph through fences as if they were never there. Adorama TV presents Take and Make Great Photography with Gavin Hoey, where you'll learn how to take stunning photos and then polish them in post-production. Here's your host, Gavin Hoey. Hello, I'm Gavin Hoey and you're watching Adorama TV, brought to you by Adorama, the camera store that has everything for us photographers. And today I come back to the British Wildlife Centre and I'm going to show you how to take photographs through fences. Now this applies to whether you're visiting a wildlife park or maybe you're just visiting say a sporting event and there's some fencing in the way. The same thing applies on both situations. So first of all, you can't just photograph up against a fence, because if I try and take a picture of our little cat here, uh -huh. I say a cat, it's a, a Scottish wild cat. It's uh, actually really vicious, despite it looking really cute. Uh, apparently it's not. But you can see in the picture, there are a load of bars going across. There's, there's blurry lines in the picture. It's just not gonna work. So there's a couple of tips to get better shots through fences. <laughs> The first one is which bit of fence do you actually shoot through? So you'll see some of our fence is in shade and other bits of our fence are in sun. You wanna shoot through the shady parts of the fence. Okay, so pick your bit of fence first of all and find a nice shady area to work in. Next, you're gonna decide on the lens and you wanna use the longest lens that you own that will actually focus on the, the subject. So I'm using my 70 to 300 millimeter. Now, this lens does have a slight downside. Its minimum focal length isn't that good. It's, it's quite a distance away. So I may find myself swapping to my 24 to 105. We'll see how we go. Next thing is the aperture that you're gonna use. Now, normally when we're doing wildlife, we, we normally want a reasonable depth of field. But in this case, if we use a reasonable depth of field, these bars are just gonna come out even sharper. That's not gonna work. So you wanna really go for a very small depth of field. So long lens, small depth of field. You can already see a slight flaw in the problem. If you're the sort of photographer that likes to use wide angle, big depth of field, then this may not be the ideal time to take your wildlife photographs. But hey, we're in a, uh, a wildlife park, a, a zoo, we're in a, a place where we have restricted access, but we're still gonna get the best photographs we can here on location. So next thing to do is to go as close to the bars as you can. If I try and take a picture from back here, and we take a little picture, um, I can still see the bars. Yes, they are blurry because I'm using a small depth of field, but they're still most definitely there. Whereas if I go closer, the bars disappear, as does the Scottish wildcat. It's just a bit... <laughs> Now, when you're looking through your viewfinder, try and, and look for the gap in the bars. Now, I know that sounds daft because you're very close, but these little holes are actually quite small. These are probably less than an inch in square size. But nonetheless, when I'm zooming in and looking through, as I move the camera just a little tiny bit, sometimes I'll be more aware of the bars than others. So just a little bit of camera movement can just give you that edge when you're looking through fences. <laughs> So you may notice something a little bit unusual about my lens today. It has a, uh, well, <laughs> a funny end. Now it's actually got two things here that can work really well if you're photographing through fences. First is an ultraviolet or protection filter. I always use these filters on my lenses, but I always use the ones with the anti-reflection coating. If you use them without the anti-reflection coating, they are nowhere near as good and actually can cause you more problems than they solve. The reason I'm using it here is because I'm gonna be pushing my lens right up against the bars. If I push my lens against the bar, there is a slight chance I might scratch the lens. I'd rather scratch a protection filter if I had to scratch something. But for a belt and braces, I'm also using this rubber lens hood as well. And this little thing's brilliant. Uh, it Not only does it cut out the, the flare from this really rather bright day, but also it uh, means I can push it flat down. So it's now down nice and flat, and I can push that rubber against the, uh, the fence, again, giving me a little extra bit of protection. Thank <laughs> you. 
Now, much as we'd love to think that just by following a set of rules, you're gonna get a perfect photograph, guess what? Uh, that doesn't always work. So despite following all of the rules, using a small aperture number, going really close, zooming in, finding in a hole, and all the other tips I've just given you, sometimes it just doesn't work. Sometimes you still have a problem with your picture. Sometimes you get sort of a ringing effect around the edge, particularly on very small mesh like that. Don't worry, try again and keep taking photographs. The more you take, the more chance you're gonna get it right. So my last tip isn't really photographic, it's just practical. This fence, it's here for a reason. And don't go shoving your fingers through there because you need your fingers and this little Scottish wildcat may look absolutely quite tame and friendly, but trust me, he would have my fingers off given half a chance. Maybe a bit of an exaggeration, but I'm not gonna find out. And if there's two fences, well, that's probably for an even more dangerous creature. If you're going to a zoo and you're photographing lions, don't cross over the first fence to get to the second one. Just be sensible. We want you to be able to take more photographs next week and not have this as your final ever photograph. Oh yeah, look at that scary looking wildcat. Ooh, terrifying. Grr. <laughs> so you're really telling me that is a scary animal? That is a scary animal. You want to come in and stroke it, by all means? <laughs> Well, I decided that going and stroking the Scottish wildcat was probably not a good idea. But let's have a look at one of the images I shot and run through a quick edit of what I did. So when you get your images into RAW or into Photoshop or into Lightroom, you sometimes find that shooting through a fence, you don't always get to see the whole thing correctly on the back of the camera. And sometimes you can find bits of fence just creeping in or even just the shape of the fence on the blurry areas of the picture. You can possibly see a sort of almost a square just there. Now that's perfectly normal and sometimes the, the fix is really simple. Just get the crop tool and remove the bits that you don't want to see. So um, I can still see a little bit there. I'm just going to crop it in something like that. So there's my crop. The rest of the adjustments are going to be, well, no more than just normal adjustments to the picture. So for example, I'm going to tweak the white balance a little bit and maybe pull back the highlights and open up the shadows. And of course, I'm going to put some clarity in here as well. Now, when I put clarity on fur, it works really well, but it doesn't work so well on the out of focus fur. So what I want to do is just put clarity here onto the face. So instead of applying clarity with the slider, I'm just going to get the adjustment brush and I'm just going to dial in plus 50. And I'm just going to paint in my own clarity just where I want it, just something like that. So that applies clarity only where I want it and it's nowhere else. Perfect. I can open up the image, leave raw behind and bring the picture into Photoshop because I want to do two more things that are just a little bit harder to do in raw and much easier to do in Photoshop. First one is just to tone down this green area, especially in the top right corner. Now to do it, I'm going to use layer, new adjustment layer and hue saturation. Now this allows me to be very specific about what colors I change, because if I change from master, I can choose reds, yellows, greens. Ah, that's what we want. I'll click on the greens. But is this green area actually green? Well, the way to find out is to get the eyedropper tool, get the first one. And then I'm just gonna click on the green that I want to change. And I find out actually, no, that's technically a yellow. But that's why you do this with the eyedropper tool, just to sample the right color. Then I'm just gonna get the saturation and we'll bring the saturation for that green stroke yellow down a bit and we'll adjust the lightness as well. But if you look really closely at the picture, when I adjust these sliders, yes, that green changes, but so does the face of the Scottish wildcat. So we've got to do this, well, let's put it around about there as a setting, but we've got to do it so it only affects that green area at the back and not the face. Well, here's the beauty of an, a, an adjustment layer. It comes with a layer mask as standard. So all I need to do is just get my paintbrush, make sure it's loaded with black, and I can paint in the color and return it by masking away the effect. Okay, so that's pretty much done. Let's go and deal with the other problem. I'll click on the actual photograph, so that's the active layer, and I'll zoom in a bit over these blades of grass that I'm not quite so keen on. So removing things in a photograph normally 
I'll go with the spot healing brush. That's my go-to tool, the, the number one feature I'll use whenever I want to clone or heal. Trouble is, it doesn't work very well if things are out of focus, and it doesn't work very well if things are right on the edge of the frame. Guess what? That's where, exactly where this bit of grass is, right on the edge and a bit out of focus. So in that case, I'll switch to the good old-fashioned clone stamp tool, and all I need to do is just sample an area and just paint it in. Now it's often a good idea just to move the sample point round a little bit every now and again, just so you don't end up with a completely repeating pattern, and you can just blend in the tones like that. And then all I need to do is repeat it for the other bit of grass that's bothering me, which is this one right here. Now this one's a bit harder because we have some whiskers, and if you're a purist, then what I'm going to do may upset you slightly because I'm going to remove some of the whiskers. But I will just sample an area of the picture that has some whiskers, and then we can just kind of paint that area in like so, and we'll just tidy up underneath it. And there you go, the effect is seamless, you can't see where the grass was at all, but that completes my picture and my edit of the Scottish Wildcat. Well, it's been brilliant taking photographs here at the British Wildlife Centre in Surrey. I've had a great time and got some wonderful photographs along the way as well. Now, if you want to see more videos by myself and the other presenters here on Adorama TV, then don't forget all you've got to do is click on the subscribe button. I'm Gavin Howey, thanks for watching. Do you want great looking prints at low cost? Be sure to visit our easy to use online printing service. Adorama Pix has professionals who treat your images with the utmost care that you can count on. For a quick turnaround on photos, cards, or albums, use adoramapix.com.